Thank you. I'm Dennis Avery. I'll be speaking tomorrow. Today I'm only moderating. They say I'm not very good at being moderate, but I'm going to show you. Our, uh, our first two speakers will be talking about whether global warming harms human health. The first of them is John Dunn, who is a physician and a lawyer, and he teaches emergency medicine, and he's a policy advisor to the American Council on Science and Health. Our second health speaker is Jerry Arnett, who is a pulmonologist in private practice in West Virginia. He is a Heartland policy advisor, and he also is a policy advisor to the ACSH. Then, looking at the third world more than the first world, we'll have Paul Dreesen, who is an advisor to the Council on Racial Equality and wrote a dynamic book called Eco-Imperialism, Green Power, Black Death. And our final panelist will be Todd Wynn, how the EPA has become a political tool. I have a particular interest in that as a former bureaucrat. He started with the Cascade Policy Institute in Oregon and now directs energy, environment, and agriculture for the American Legislative Exchange Council. John, would you care to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you. The uh, projections here are basically just kind of a guide and an outline so that you can read and see some of the words that I'm saying. Um, First, I'd like to take a commercial break. Um, I work at uh, Fort Hood, uh, which is an Army base at the emergency department, and uh, the people at, at my emergency department have decided that there is a great similarity between me and a beer salesman. salesman. So uh, I want to do my uh, audition to take over selling Dos Equis beer <laughs> when the most interesting man in the world finally retires. Um, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I drink Dos Equis. <laughs> Stay thirsty, my friends. All right. So, um, James Taylor told me last night, he said, John, get to the science, get to the science. This is a, this is a conference on real science. And it has to do with the idea that there really is a good scientific method out there. It's just been discarded by people that we are dealing with. And there are a number of writers that I thought were appropriate references for all of you to consider in terms of why it is and how it is that this has become such an insane non-discussion, non-debate. Eric Hoffer is... Uh, one of the greatest philosophers in America, and he wrote a great deal about the true believer, mass movements, why it is that people are dragged into mass movements, why they're committed to them, why their approaches and attitudes to their opponents are in many cases hateful and very aggressive. And I would recommend his writings. He said, our sense of power is more vivid when we break a man's spirit than when we win his heart. The savior who wants to turn men into angels is as much a hater of human, human nature as the totalitarian despot who would like to turn them into puppets. Frederick Hayek, who's a favorite of Heartland Institute because he's one of the great economists of all time, called it the fatal conceit. The idea that if you give me enough information, I'm smart enough to be able to plan a society and tell everybody how to live. Joseph. Schumpeter said that truth is the first casualty of idealism, and I think those things are true. Thomas Sowell writes about intellectuals and talks about how intellectuals are the only people who are not accountable. They're never tested for whether their theories really work. They, they operate and they sell words, they sell concepts, but they don't really have to prove that they're right. George Orwell says, during times of universal deceit, and we are living in that time now, my friends, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act, and I appreciate all of you being revolutionaries. There are some ideas, George Orwell says, that are so preposterous that only an intellectual can believe them. 
Angelo Cotavi is one of my favorite writers and has become that since 2009 when he wrote an essay in American Spectator, a wonderful magazine that you should all read. Angelo is a former political science uh, professor at Boston University and he was previously an intelligence agent and, and worked for the Senate Intelligence Committee. He wrote a wonderful book about other nations and political systems, but the essay that I think got my attention was his essay in the spring of 2009 on scientific pretense and democracy. I won't tell you all the things that he said in the essay, but what he essentially talked about was the administrative state and how people get assigned the dignitaries a right to say that they know what they're talking about. And when politicians are in a position to just tell you who the experts are, they're also in the position to tell you to shut up. And that's what we're dealing with. Angelo went on and in 2010 wrote probably one of the uh, seminal articles on the situation that we're dealing with, the American, America's ruling class and the perils of revolution. And what he essentially said was this, intellectuals are a dangerous bunch. And don't let them assume too much of their so-called intelligence. Because frequently, they're the ones that pick up the worst ideas and carry them forward as though there were no questions to be asked. No skeptics are allowed, no dissent. Paul Johnson is a great historian, and most of you, Paul Johnson, is a great historian, and most of you probably have read some of his books. He wrote so many books now that I can't even remember. I've got only a few of his books. But he said in his book called Intellectuals, for intellectuals, far from being highly individualistic and non-conformist people, they are actually conformist. They are ultra-conformists. That is what makes them, en masse, so dangerous. H.L. Mencken, one of our favorites, said that the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed so that they will be anxious to be led to safety. And if you're in charge, there's nothing you like better than a populace that's scared to death, afraid of the uncertainties, and would want someone to save them from what they fear may be a catastrophe. When you deal with people who think that the world is bound for a catastrophe, you can assume that those same people are looking for some kind of easy answer being provided by statists. Moral certainty is always a sign of cultural, cultural inferiority. I think that's a very good statement. I'm not sure that I understand it completely, but I do think it comes from the sort of inadequacies that people who tend to be pushy have. And some of those pushy people are in the business of science and telling us what to think and asking us not to ask any questions or to be skeptical. Frank Ferriti wrote a great, uh, a, well, he, did, he gave a great speech on the precautionary principle. And I think that's something that applies to our discussions these days, the days today and tomorrow and the next day. What we need to understand is the precautionary principle is taken over the lives for some people who just can't stand the idea of uncertainty. They want an answer for everything and they're scared to death of everything. And it is, in a sense, a decline of our society for us to have that as a predominant way to make policy. Precautionary principle is a dumb thing. It is a thing that is frightened of everything. And what Faridi says in his speech, I think, is worth looking it up. Uh, in recent times, European culture has become confused about the meaning of uncertainty and risk. Only rarely is uncertainty about something looked upon as an opportunity to take responsibility for our destiny. Invariably, uncertainty is presented as a marker for danger, and change is often re re regarded with dread. Pascal Bruckner recently wrote a piece in City Journal about the apocalyptic attitude of the intellectual class. And I think it's worth your look. Because what he says is that this has come from, first, Marxism designated capitalism as responsible for human misery. And secondly, the third world ideology, disappointed by the bourgeois indulgences of the working class, targeted the West supposedly the inventor of slavery, 
colonialism, imperialism, and I would add industrial progress, all the good things that have brought this planet to the state that we're in where people are living longer than ever and where there is enough food for everybody if we just get it moved around. Vaclav Klaus is going to say that environmentalism is the new totalitarianism. Richard Feynman says the problem with these modern day liars is that they put up a form of cargo cult science which is good in form but without content. No questions really are asked, assumptions are made, and they look like scientists. They have white coats. So, is there a way to get to science and policy making that will make sense? Daubert is the way. It's a legal rule that says only good science is allowed in the courtroom. And so many things are decided in the courtroom. The reference manual on scientific evidence is something that everybody in this room should get because it essentially outlines the rules for how scientists should conduct themselves and how good science can produce reliable evidence that's admissible in a court of law. And that's one of the reasons why I emphasize it so much to people that I know who are both in policy and in scientific areas. So why is warm good for the planet? Because we operate at 98.6. At 56 degrees, which is the average temperature around the planet, give or take a degree, depending upon who's taken which monitors off, uh, 56 degrees is going to make you miserable if you have to uh, endure it. You cannot assume that 56 degrees is the ideal uh, average temperature of the planet because not only is it not a good average temperature for people who live at 98.6, it's also not the temperature that means anything. Because if you live in Texas, temperature varies 20 degrees every day, right? So the point that I would like to emphasize about the, the effects of warm is that warm is good for people, and it's good particularly for you as, as you get older because it has an effect on your circulation. There are plenty of studies that are in the fine books done by Idso and, and uh, Fred Singer that include in chapter nine all the studies that show that warm is good for you, that warm spells, in, although they do uh, kill some people, they create what's called a harvesting effect because the people that the warm spells kill are people who are already moribund, right? So if you take a look at the studies, the people that are killed during cold spells are people who wouldn't have died. The people who are, are killed during warm spells, the severe ones, are people who were in fact very severely ill and very close to death. So if you look at the studies that have been done, you can see that wintertime will produce a significant increase in deaths. Cold waves, according to a study by Keating, have a 10 to 1 uh, disadvantage with regards to producing deaths. It's so in Singer's chapter, uh, both the original chapter and the chapter in the interim report, which was published in 2011, have wonderful analyses of all the human health effects studies. And here's a list of them. Canada, United States, China, uh, all of them show that warm is good for people. They also did, and these are the uh, references uh, incidentally, there will be on the policy bot a more co comprehensive handout that I did for this, uh, for this lecture. And if you look, you will find, for example, on the website that Idso and Singer have, uh, an article that shows that even in places like Seattle, cooler weather produces more deaths. Even in places like Seattle. So. The Copenhagen consensus says, you got to be kidding. If you want to do the right thing for the human race, warming certainly is not an important issue. Nutrition, water, sewage, housing, some basic preventive health measures, those are the things that will make a difference. Warming 
even if it's on the high side of the range of predicted by the IPCC, is going to change the average temperature to about 60 degrees. Anybody in here wear socks when you go to sleep now? I used to sleep with no clothes on. All right? And my wife laughs at me all the time. She said, John, uh, you know, what's the deal with the flannel pajamas and the, and the socks? Well, it's because when you get older, your blood vessels don't work quite as good as they used to. And when you're exposed to cold, you're going to have more problems as you get older. It's the truth. Now, if you say, well, yeah, but what about kids? Kids get sick more often in the wintertime. There isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know that. So, how is it that cold is good? What are these guys trying to do to us? 